Hey, welcome to Emmaus Road Online. Thank you for joining with us. My name's Adam, I'm one of the pastors here. Today we're gonna be carrying on our series, Come Holy Spirit, looking at the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. Today, P. Greg is gonna be sharing with us and carrying on looking at the theme of fruits of the Holy Spirit from Galatians 5. Check this out. We're reading from Galatians 5, 16 through 25. So I say, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Glenda, so much. Uh, The eagle-eyed among you will notice that this is the same scripture that we uh, had last week. And that is deliberate because this is part two of a series exploring Galatians chapter 5 and the verses often referred to as the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I'm really excited to be sharing this message uh, with you today. Uh, I I think that for some of you this is going to be a message that you all want to revisit and recall because it will be new and it will be transformative for your lives. And uh, if you find yourself Uh, here today or watching online, longing to be different, longing to be kinder, more loving, more patient, wondering if that is even possible. And if so, what are the dynamics and conditions for such lasting spiritual formation to take place? Then this message I believe will be very practically helpful for you. It's part of this series we're doing entitled Come Holy Spirit. It's been extraordinary so far. If you've missed any of them, I'd really encourage you to go back and and, uh, watch or listen to the previous ones in the series. We kicked off on Pentecost Sunday with Jonathan Helzer three weeks ago. uh, Really sharing the most powerful stories about the Father's heart to pour out his Holy Spirit upon us. And then two weeks ago, we had Pete Hughes from KXC, King's Cross London, uh, doing just this sort of masterful overview of helping us to get the, the, the context of understanding the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, in the backdrop, against the backdrop of the Bible. And uh, it, was, it was a masterclass. And then last week, Hannah Heather uh, always just speaks so brilliantly and eloquently and and whimsically uh, and uh, just introduced this passage of of the fruits of the Holy Spirit and really uh, reminded us that this isn't something we kind of strive towards, but this is about abiding in God. And... um, so we, we, we approach this passage asking the question, how can we change? How can we become better people? How can we become a more beautiful version of ourselves, not just outwardly, but inwardly in our characters where it really counts? And this really is the million-dollar question, uh, literally. The self-help industry uh, turned over 13.2 billion dollars last year. The Times newspaper released a a major supplement entitled Improve Your Life. 
Uh, there's an app that you can download that guarantees to make you nicer. And uh, the way it does it, this is it auto-mutes you if you talk too much. <laughs> Some of you thinking, I know someone I'd like to send that to, which means that you yourself need to be made nicer. But the question really is how on earth does this happen? The agnostic author Douglas Copeland, uh, Canadian, he wrote a collection of short stories you may have read entitled Life After God. And in one of the stories in that compilation, he describes a feeling of great sadness because he says, I realized that once people are broken in certain ways, they can't ever be fixed. And this is something nobody ever tells you when you are young, and it never fails to surprise you as you grow older, as you see the people in your life break one by one. And you wonder, he says, when your turn is going to be, or if it has already happened. Pretty depressing outlook. But is he right? Can broken people actually be fixed? Are we all ultimately destined to break or to remain broken? Well, the Bible and 2,000 years of Christian history responds to Douglas Copeland with a big, fat, resounding no. It is possible to be fixed. It is possible to be changed. The inner struggle can be won. Addictions can be broken. Negative traits in your history do not have to hold you prisoner for your destiny. But the Bible teaches that this is not through a self-help app or a time supplement, or through clenching your buttocks and trying to be nicer, the Bible teaches very, very clearly that the transformation comes through the Holy Spirit by allowing the goodness of God to come and be so resident within you that almost by a process of osmosis, his presence begins to transform us. And I can prove that this works because if you look around this room, you can talk to almost anyone who's been a Christian for a while. And if you ask them a question, how has God changed you? They will have an answer. They will be the first to say, I'm not perfect yet. But we experience the transformation. We often share testimonies. We recently had baptisms. We've got more coming up when people will share the stories of God breaking into their lives. And one of the things I love about that is you don't just see lives changing, but family trees changing. You see uh, cycles of curses turning to be becoming generational blessings. And the Bible speaks about inner transformation coming from the Holy Spirit. It's, it's about abiding. That's one of the um, words that Hannah used last week, in the Holy Spirit. I have a friend who owns a vineyard. And she said to me, you know, you can taste in the wine the soil in which the grapes grew. Where you are planted, that's what you will taste of. If you abide in Christ, then you will ultimately start to, if you like, taste of, smell of, look like the goodness of Christ. Now, I, I can hear what you're thinking because it's what I would be thinking if I was sitting down there listening to someone saying all this. You may well be thinking, this all sounds pretty vague and passive, does this just mean that somehow, magically, by wandering around saying, come Holy Spirit a lot, I'm going to become a nicer person? If I come down to the front enough, will I just sort of turn from being nasty to being good, more beautiful? Isn't that incredibly passive? 
And the answer is yes, that is rather passive. And actually, if we read Galatians 5 clearly, we'll see it is highly active. We activate, we make choices to enable ourselves to receive the grace of God. Some people say, oh, if there's any act, action, any work involved, then it's not grace, and they're completely and utterly wrong. Any form of spiritual discipline, it's called a means of grace, is a way of unclenching our fist to receive. It's a way of hoisting the sail to catch the wind. And so we have to do the hard work of opening ourselves to the free gift of God. And the passage that we've just heard so brilliantly read uh, by Glenda again and again talks about very stark choices you must make. And if you do not make these choices, you will not change no matter how many times you say, come Holy Spirit. That was quite controversial, but I meant it. Verse 18. Choose to walk in the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Again and again, you've got the flesh and the law on one side, and you've got the spirit and grace on the other, okay? Uh, so, so there's a choice here between the spirit and the desires of the flesh. Notice that if you choose to walk in the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, the desires of the flesh are still there. It's just you will have the power not to gratify them. Who here knows that the desires of the flesh are still there? Everyone except one, no. <laughs> Do you see, the, the desires are still there, but their power, their tyranny in your life gets broken. That's verse 16. Verse 18, be led by the Holy Spirit. No, notice, this isn't like taking a horse to water. It's not the Holy, you get saved, and the Holy Spirit will drag you everywhere involuntarily. It's choose to be led by the Holy Spirit. Verse 25, live by the Spirit. Keep in step with the Spirit. It is a daily choice. It presumably, therefore, is possible to run ahead of the Holy Spirit or lag behind the Holy Spirit in our lives. The choice we are presented with, again and again, actually, in the New Testament, is to either root ourselves in the flesh or root ourselves in the Spirit. And the fruit, if you root yourself in the flesh, will be ugliness in your life. Selfishness, bitterness, immorality, orgies, and the other exciting things listed in that passage. If you root yourself in the Spirit, on the other hand, the fruit in your lives will be extraordinarily compelling. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine fruits that are not a bad description of a truly beautiful and meaningful life. So, we need to make some choices and learn to make some choices to root ourselves in the goodness of God. But now I want to get even more practical. How on earth do we do this? How do we root ourselves in the Spirit? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? How do we live by the Spirit? And I, there's a lot of answers to that questions, but I, question, but I want to give you just two means of grace, two practical things that will really help you to, to root yourself in the Spirit that you will see character transformation, the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And the two means of grace are these, one, meditation, and two, fellowship. Meditation and fellowship, okay? Got that? I hate it when preachers do this, but say to the person next to you, meditation and fellowship. <laughs> and I'll say, your breath smells great this morning. <laughs> okay. Meditation. Here's the first one. Meditation, cleanse your mind. Cleanse your mind. You are a mashup of the things you allow into your life. You are a mashup of whatever you happen to let through the doors of your eyes or your ears or your heart. 
Romans 8 verse 5 to 6 says, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. If you thought it was a stark choice before, now it's really stark. Here's another one. Philippians 4 verse 8, whatever is true, you know this one, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What, may I ask you, are you filling your mind with? Where is your focus? What thoughts paradigms, images, temptations are you allowing into your inner world? You'll be aware that there's been a lot of study in recent years into neuroplasticity. This is now the well-established discovery that the things we experience change the way we think and therefore the way we behave. They did um, a series of MRI studies on uh, London taxi drivers, cabbies. Uh, you may know that um, I think still, even in the world of GPS, that to be a, a London cabbie, you have to do a, an extensive test called The Knowledge, capital T, capital K, because the streets of London are some of the most complicated in the world. And uh, it's seen as important that when you jump into a cab and say, take me to so-and-so, they know where they're going. And um, so uh, London cabbies, unlike just Uber drivers in London or whatever, have got extraordinary knowledge. And um, this is hackney cabs, you know. And um, anyway, they, they, they did some MRI scans on uh, cabbies, and they found that a particular part of their brain was larger, was more developed because of they've had all these years of practicing the knowledge. It's that bit of their brain that's understanding uh, the layout of, of this complicated city. The things you think about shape your brain. This clearly is one of the dangers of pornography, which is designed to be addictive and is utterly destructive to yourself, to your sex life, to your relationships, and so on. This is one of the dangers of, uh, you know, horror movies. Now, this a little bit of scariness is probably okay, but when we're actually filling our minds with that stuff, we understand it. We say to children, you don't want to watch this because you'll have bad dreams. And then we think when we're adults, we are completely different species. What are you allowing into your mind? This is one of the dangers of cynical company. I'm not saying that you separate yourself from the world, but I know there are some people who are just like battery acid. You spend time with them and it drags you down. Some of you are saying, well, that's my mother. <laughs> it wasn't a word of knowledge. But <laughs> But, but, but we have to be careful what we allow into our lives. By the way, don't separate yourself from your mother. <laughs> She'll never speak to me again. This is one of the reasons it's very important we deal with trauma appropriately. What is trauma? You know, I know some of you have Ukrainian families now living with you, going through all sorts of different levels of trauma. We're absolutely inundated with all sorts of demands, not least the Ukrainian crisis in our transformation work here. And these are people who've experienced trauma. But of course, trauma can manifest in many ways. Sammy and I have had to process trauma. Perhaps we still are processing trauma to do with some of the things that we have been through. You must deal with it appropriately at the right time and the right pace, keep in step with the spirit. Because otherwise, your brain your, will be shaped in a negative way. But the Lord Jesus Christ can turn negatives into positives. 
some box set series, some podcasts, some music, some Insta accounts are not sinful, but neither are they noble, pure, lovely, and admirable. And so I'm not saying you can only sort of think about Christian things and look at Christian films. It's very limiting. You have to, you know, I don't know, The Hiding Place and Jesus of Nazareth and maybe we'll allow you, um, what's that Eric Little film? You know, Chariots of Fire, <laughs> The Mission. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Veggie Tales. It's, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it, some of you are saying you're describing my childhood. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying that, but I am saying, guys, this is the scripture. And this is about choosing life or death. And the apostle is saying to you, looking you in the eyes, saying, think about things that are noble. Think about things that are admirable. Think about things that, that, that are praiseworthy. And this was in an age long before we had such incredibly powerful tools through smartphones and everything else. That, can so, that are designed, the brightest people in the world are being hired. They're no longer being hired by bra you know, to do brain surgery. They're being hired to manipulate our brains <laughs> for the sake of profit. And they're hired to the highest bidder, which is Silicon Valley. And, and so I believe the teaching of the Apostle Paul is not more irrelevant than it's ever been. I believe it is more urgent than it has ever been for us as people who seek to be different. What do you fill your minds with? In the worship time, Pete Burton was standing here playing guitar. Pete's going to see, who is it, the Red Hot Chili Peppers tonight? He was up late last night watching... Paul McCartney with Bruce Springsteen and Dave Grohl playing together at Glastonbury. All three men of faith, interestingly. Only Bruce would call himself a Christian if you haven't watched his, his series uh, on Broadway. Right at the end, he just finishes the whole thing with the Lord's Prayer. It's very moving without the actions. Um, <laughs> you'll be disappointed to hear. Dave Grohl, I've read his, his memoir. He talks about when one of his friends was very sick in hospital, actually the guy who's just died is drummer, but when he was sick in hospital in South Kensington, how he'd walk to the hospital each day and pray. And Paul McCartney talks, talks very openly about his belief in the afterlife and so on, or men of faith, at least one would call themselves Christian, there they are leading millions and millions of people in these great songs. But anyway, Pete was here somewhere between Paul McCartney and, <laughs> and the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which basically describes his entire life playing guitar and the thing is this his little son Xander how old Xander almost two very important almost two is there we were all like worshiping the screen right like that in front of the screen and Xander was looking diagonally at his dad just staring at his dad and and Pete was staring straight back at him and they were just having this little moment it went on and on for like an embarrassingly long period of time you cannot tell me that kid is not going to grow up loving music. <laughs> you, you understand? What you worship, you become. What you focus on becomes what you look like. The things that fill our minds ultimately shape our lives. And so can I gently encourage you this summer, where perhaps we have a little time to review and live a little more slowly, Listen to perhaps music that is positive. Read Christian books. That's a really old-fashioned thing to say, isn't it? But why wouldn't you want to read, say, biographies of great men and women of God and learn from their lives? What a gift. Study things that are beautiful. Retrain yourself in your marriage or in your family to try and talk about things that are lovely. You say to me, I don't want to go all Julie Andrews and fake. And I want to tell you, you are in no danger of that. You're in danger of something far darker and more cynical. Just try a little, shall we, to rejoice always. And again, I say, rejoice. Let your speech be seasoned with salt. So meditation. But the second means of grace I want to present to you today. Uh, which, again, will help you to make these choices between the spirit 
and the flesh, and therefore by choosing the spirit to be changed, is fellowship. Fellowship. This is about making healthy attachments. And I need to talk to you here, not so much about theology, but psychology, and you'll see how this fits. Sammy and I used to, we, we led a, a, a lovely guy who's a dear friend to this day called Paul to Jesus. And he lived with us for a while. He, he, I've talked about him before. You know, he, he was coming off every drug known to man and, um, you know, had been dealing drugs and, you know, was trying to find his way as a fairly new Christian. And he was finding it very, very hard to get free of addictions and, frankly, just to become the kind of person that he felt he wanted to be now that he was a follower of Jesus. Paul's story is unbelievably broken. He grew up in Birmingham. His mum had just a series of different men in her life, almost all of whom seemed to have been unpleasant. Uh, not all, but most. Um, Paul remembers walking into a room once and seeing one of her mum's latest, his mum's latest boyfriend, strangling his mum. And he thinks that the boyfriend only stopped because he walked into the room. What does that do? to a little boy and then the man the boyfriend clearly felt so guilty he started taking Paul out for treats what does that do to your brain and there was other stuff darker stuff even than that and so he grows up and then we just see someone who's doing a lot of drugs and we don't understand the brokenness the broken relationships that have led to the broken life and so Paul, as a new Christian, we found that he would often be really harsh on himself. He'd beat himself up because he was struggling to be a good Christian. He would, frankly, look at Sammy and me and beat himself up that he wasn't as nice, as he would probably say it, as us. Even though, you know, certainly I had a pretty nice middle class, safe upbringing, a mainly healthy childhood, and yet he felt it was legitimate to compare himself to me. Paul went on to study sociology, and today is, is, is quite a high-up social worker in a city not so far from here. And I still remember when he was studying sociology, he came home one day so excited with an academic paper written in small print with lots of footnotes. And he'd got a photocopy and he said, Pete, you've got to read this, you've got to read this. I've never seen anyone so excited about a small print academic paper before. It was, a, it was a psych, about psychology. And it was uh, addressing attachment theory, which um, many of you will be familiar with. Uh, I hear about little else these days now that my wife's a professional counselor. Um, I, I'll just give you a very quick uh, overview for those of you who don't know about attachment theory. Then I want to say what this paper was saying about it, which is the really interesting thing. Um, uh, attachment theory uh, was pioneered by John Bowlby in the early 20th century. Uh, and he studied the effect on infants of attachment to their parents and then separation from their parents and how different babies seem to cope differently with separation from their uh, primary carers. His thoughts, his research was expanded by Mary Ainsworth in the 1970s. And, um, uh, you know, he goes through four styles and four stages of um, attachment. So uh, stage one, uh, up to six weeks, he would call the pre-attachment stage. This is uh, until before a baby six weeks old. They, they, d they don't really have attachments to anyone. We kid ourselves that they do, but they don't. And then six weeks to seven months is what he calls the indiscriminate attachment phase. This is where they start to, babies start to develop a preference for their primary and secondary caregiver. And then uh, seven months plus, they start to develop discriminate, strong attachments to one caregiver. This is healthy babies. And then at uh, over 10 months, they develop multiple attachments. In other words, they begin to develop bonds with other caregivers as well. So this, this series 
this process of forming attachments to those who they consider safe and necessary and loving in their lives. But if that process gets interrupted, if a baby and then even a child, we can go beyond just the first uh, year, if a, if a baby or a child fails to form safe and appropriate attachments, there can be great uh, chaos in their lives. And this is what Paul's academic paper was exploring. Not the premise of attachment theory, which is pretty well established, but this paper was researching what uh, happens in adult life, what character traits tend to manifest in adult life uh, those who as children have not formed appropriate attachments. And uh, he, so he showed me this paper, it was covered in highlighter pen, and it listed nine different negative traits that are commonalities in people who have not formed appropriate attachments in infancy and childhood. And so the list is uh, just coming up for you there now on the screens. Take a look at this next slide. Yeah. Now, these are all things that you would probably expect because you may be from a chaotic or broken background. You certainly know people from very broken backgrounds and you think this makes sense. Here are the nine traits for those who are listening. Isolation, depression, Violence, anger, narcissism, criminality, divorce, aggression, and addiction. I'm sure you recognize some of those. But this piece of research was showing, so for example, my friend Paul, some of the things that he was struggling with in his life, addiction, for example, uh, criminality, yeah. <laughs> uh, better keep that one a bit quiet. Um, broken relationships, anger, and so on, could be rooted in his childhood experiences. And um, so far, so obvious, but here's where it gets quite extraordinary. I turned to him and said, Paul, that's fine, but this makes, you know, of course, you've, you've got a nightmare childhood, and now you're in a bit of a pickle, and gradually we're trying to help you get your head right because you know Jesus now. He said, no, Pete, you don't get it. And then with shaking hands, he got out the Bible verse we're looking at today. Galatians 5, verse 22. And we look together at the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think that's the next slide coming up now. And here's the thing. There's nine of them too. And... We made the most extraordinary discovery. Take a look at the next slide. Every single one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit is the exact opposite of the traits diagnosed by the secular psychologist into the effects of broken attachments in childhood. This is astounding. I've never heard anyone preach or teach about this before. It's astounding. My friend Paul made this discovery. It has massive implications, and we're going to just land this in a moment and, uh, and pray for some people. So if, you're, if you've struggled to form healthy attachments and you're struggling with isolation, the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. The opposite of depression is joy. Opposite of violence is peace. Opposite of anger, forbearance. Opposite of narcissism, Kindness, opposite of criminality, goodness, divorce, faithfulness, aggression, gentleness, addiction, self-control. Isn't that breathtaking? So you're saying, well, so what? Well, let me just unpack a few of the implications of this. The first thing is this. The psychological truth that we see here precisely mirrors a theological truth. You must be born again. You can be born again. You can, no matter what your earthly primary carer, your mother or your father, 
your adoptive parents, whoever it was, whatever they were or weren't like, you can be born into a relationship with a Father in heaven who will form a perfect and unconditionally loving and totally safe attachment with you through which you will start to receive his spirit. This is Romans chapter 8. Through the spirit within us we cry, Abba, Father. If you want to be like him, if you want to be filled with the Spirit, then you must begin by focusing on and being born again into the family of the Father. Secondly, for those of us who have broken backgrounds, I believe there is an invitation here to greater grace for ourselves. God does not compare you to other people's righteousness. He is patient with you, understanding that you are on a long journey. I remember Paul beating himself up because he was so addicted to cigarettes and was so struggling to get free. And I just looked at him and thought, but Paul, you've come off so many drugs. I, I suspect the father looks down at you smoking your 20 a day, out the back of the church meeting, having a fag, I suspect he looks down at you and says, you are more righteous and more holy than Pete Gregg, who hasn't had to do nearly such a long journey to get to his non-smoking status. Do you understand that righteousness is not a checklist, it's a journey? And he was taking extraordinary steps towards the Father. Instead of comparing yourself to others, I want to encourage you, ask how you yourself are changing. Maybe journaling. Maybe if you're ten, you have a tendency to, to condemn yourself, talk to a friend who you know likes you and say, can you see any change in me? Sometimes we need that grandmother to say, oh, how you've grown, don't we? Because we don't see it in the mirror. It may be if you have a particularly broken background and your, this talk is touching some raw nerves in you today that you should consider getting some, some counseling to begin to unpack and process things in your past. I'm uh, totally unashamed and open about the fact that in September I'm starting counseling. I'm going to get some counseling. My wife has been saying thank goodness for all our sakes at last. I just, I, I, I'm not, you know, in any particular, you know, I'm not about to go pop, don't worry. But I, I just thought, you know what, I'm 53 years old. I, 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 God did some stuff in me and I had that three-week, you know, journey in solitude across, the, you know, Scotland. And, and I just, I really want to get into this and I really want to just make sure that my, you know, get a bit healthier in my thinking and my motivation and um, so, you know, don't all rush at once. There's a bit of a backlog on counsellors. But it may be this is something you need to start thinking about. Thirdly, that was for those who've got uh, some broken attachments in their past that may be affecting their present. But for those of you with healthy and happy childhoods, can I just remind you, don't be judgmental on others who may have brokenness in their background. And by the way, they may not be poor, they may be rich, but have literally terrible uh, attachments in their past. Don't judge others. Jesus again and again talks about this. Take the plank out of your own eye before you take the splinter out of someone else's, he says. Don't think that you're giving generously and that widow over there is hardly giving anything because actually she's giving almost everything she's got. He who is without sin, let them cast the first stone. Don't be like the Pharisee, thank you, Lord, that I am not like other men. But be like the tax collector with all the snot going down his beard saying, Father, forgive me, I'm a mess. The fourth challenge here is clearly the importance of parenting of parenting children well, of, you know, all that time you spend when you think you're missing out on life. If you're a primary carer, feeling that the world is passing you by as you change nappies and as you, as you talk like an infant to an infant, as you cook beige food, chicken nuggets and chips, and 
you know, as you can't go out in the evening because of your, you know, all that stuff. Do you understand? This is the highest calling of your life to form attachments with this child because it is through those attachments that you are giving to that child that they can be filled with the Spirit and they can be full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness as they grow up. It doesn't happen by magic. You can't, you know, mess them up at this stage and then send them off to Soul Survivor in later life and think that by doing that a bit, they're suddenly going to turn into magically nice people because they did an alpha course and got baptized. Form attachments of love and faithfulness and understand in doing that, you're discipling the nations by discipling your own children. Amen? And I want to say really clearly at this point, if you feel you failed as a parent, there is grace for you. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But there may be some things you want to process there. Please, others of you, is it possible that God is calling you to foster? What an unbelievably important mission field. Some people are more interested in discipling Kazakhstan than discipling someone who is desperate for a family on their own doorstep. So Adrian and Pauline Hawkes and Haley, they're old friends of ours. They're wonderful Christians. They love Jesus. They've helped many, many families uh, to foster. They do it brilliantly. And if you've even got half a thought... Maybe this is something I should explore. This will, you'll probably never have a better opportunity. All you've got to do is wander over to the founder's studio afterwards and just ask a few questions. No one's going to force you to do anything, sign anything up. But can I encourage you? I'd love us as a church. I know many of you are already doing this. But to push into opening our homes and opening our families and helping kids who otherwise will not form healthy attachments with all the ongoing implications in their lives to do so through the grace of God in you. Fifth implication of this, there are seven, so we're almost there. The key to character development is healthy attachment, fellowship, with those who will love you unconditionally and with relationships that can be redemptive and transformative. In other words, Please get stuck in with collectives because that is the context in which you can go on a relational journey with a smaller group of people where you can love and be loved. And it is in the context of deepening friendships that we are filled with the Spirit and our lives are transformed. Do you know the only way you can learn how to love unconditionally is to be annoyed by somebody. I mean, otherwise, it's just conditional. I really like you. You're amazing. So I have certain friends. Sammy's like, you're impossible. Anything they say you think is funny, you just like these people too much. I don't love them unconditionally. I just love them because they're just lovable. But then there are a few friends who, let's just say my love has to be unconditional for them. Get stuck in with collectives. Get stuck in with Safar, such a great tool. Go on a discipleship journey. Maybe that. Maybe you're saying, I don't know if I want counseling, but I do want to just begin to process some of this stuff. Safar, as you know, is our great discipleship journey. Many, many of you are either going through with someone or you're doing it uh, for someone else. It may be that in your background, if you look back, there's a trail of broken relationships. Maybe you're the sort of person who every stage of life you have another set of friends and you just say goodbye to them and move on to the next. Maybe you've really struggled to hold faithfulness in friendships. Can I just suggest that that is intrinsically linked to your ability to be filled with the Spirit and to change in your character? Can I suggest that maybe there's some work to do, some things to pray? Please don't condemn yourself. But I believe faithfulness, forbearance, patience, kindness are marks of the Spirit and they have to be outworked somewhere. Sixthly, penultimately, we are filled with the Spirit. We are changed, not just through prayer ministry at church, but through healthy relationships and unconditional love. So I would ask you to ask yourself, which of your friendships are good for you? Do 
your friends who you need in your life know how much you need them? Do you spend enough time with them, or is it just a thing that happens once in a while? What if God's means of grace for you is a particular person? And what if that person is God's answer to many of the prayers you pray when you're alone? God, change my heart. Help me to be less angry. Help me to be kinder. What if God has raised up that friendship to be his means of blessing in your life? Not in a magical way, but through consistent fellowship over months and years. What if that person is there, but you only see them once every three months in any meaningful way? Can I ask you, push into the friendships that are good for you, that the Spirit may move in your life. And finally, there is an invitation in this entire message. Remember, it's not just fellowship and attachments. But meditation, what we fill our minds with, there's an invitation here for some of us, I believe, to repent of filling our minds with things that are unlovely and are impure. Amen. Okay. You all right? Was that too challenging? It was okay, was it? You're always so encouraging. Well, listen, let's just get the band back up. We're only going to take five minutes here. Cause, I mean, it's a bit silly if I say, now come to the front, open your hands, and let's say, come Holy Spirit, because I've done a whole talk. I mean, I believe in it. Please, please, please hear me. I really believe in that, okay? You know me. I really believe in that. You can have extraordinary transformation in moments where we invite the Spirit to come. Uh, accelerated, and sometimes those moments are, uh, are the outworking of relationships and attachments, you understand? So I'm, I'm positive about all of that. But I think what we're going to do to finish now is deliberately not have a come Holy Spirit moment in the conventional way, but a come Holy Spirit moment in just our thinking. Because really today has been about what we fill our minds with, And what we do with our relationships. And so I'd love you just to sit quietly while the band plays something appropriate. (laughs) I said appropriate, Pete. Um, And and just make some notes. You know, this, this, I've tried to say there's more intentionality and choice involved in opening ourselves to the grace of God than we sometimes admit. There's no other way to read these, these scriptures. And, and there's a heresy that's being taught in the church the moment that you just do nothing and vaguely have feelings and you get changed and that's grace. That is not grace. That's dumb. And so I want to just challenge you. If you're saying, yeah, I do want to change. I do want to become more like Jesus. I do want to be more filled with the Spirit. And today I, I, I've said it's about friendships and it's about what you think about. So I want to invite you. You may find it helpful to get your phone out or get a scrap of paper out. Just what's one thing you're going to do out of this message? And just as you, as you gather all that I've said and just uh, that's the point I want to remember. You know that thing when you blank. Like if I come up to you tomorrow and say, what was the thing in my talk that you, you like most? You say, oh, it was brilliant. It's brilliant. Can't remember a word of it. Just, I know, I know. Just just write one thing down I want to remember this is it is it about meditation what am I filling my mind with is there some changes that are necessary there is it an invitation to create a worship playlist decent stuff Is there a box set that you're in the middle of that's turned a little dark and a little gratuitous? And you're thinking, you know, I don't think I want that in my mind. Is there a cynical relationship that you need to just pull back from a little? Or a healthy, life-giving one you need to push into a bit more? Is there a lot of brokenness in your background and you beat yourself up a lot comparing yourself with others and you just need to receive some grace today? hear the Father say, you're doing good. It's okay. You've been judging someone else. A little bit of the old Pharisee coming in. And bottom line is, you just had an easier start in life. 
God speaking to you about fostering. Opening your home. Is it even just a vague maybe? Are you thinking, I think there's some negative attachments in my past that might be affecting me profoundly and I think I might need to begin to walk back there and address them. I could go on, but there's been about 300 challenges in this message. Just grab one. Just grab one. What's it going to be this week? So come, Holy Spirit, just move in this room now. We want to abide in you. Not just on Sundays, but on Mondays. Fill us up. Help us to walk in step with you. We want to be holy because you are holy. We want to choose life, not death. We want to be more beautiful, not more ugly as the years go on. Finally, it may be a challenge for someone here. I said this all begins actually by being born again. Beginning a relationship with the God who made you as an unconditionally loving Father. It's the ultimate attachment that brings life and love and joy and kindness and forbearance. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, all you have to do is open your life to him. Say sorry for the rubbish stuff that you've done and said, thought. Except that when he died on the cross, he died for you. Because he loves you. Because he could not handle being detached from you. He wanted to form that attachment with you through which life and joy and love can flow in you and through you to those around you. This is an invitation to become a Christian. If you don't know Jesus today, it is the single most life-changing, difficult and wonderful thing you will ever do. Don't wait till you've got all the answers. You will never have them. But just make a simple choice. Yes, Jesus, count me in. Clean me up. Fill me up. Talk to someone probably here because you know a Christian. Talk to them. Say, I, I think I need to do that. I need to explore becoming a Christian. Come on our next Alpha course. That's a great way to explore what all this means. Amen. Great. I had to wait till the end of the song. Great. We've run out of time. Let's just pray. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forevermore, world without end. Amen. Go in the name of the Father who loves you and love people. Go in the name of his Son, Jesus, and serve people. And go in the power of the Holy Spirit to be filled with life in a dying world. Amen. Brilliant. Carla Harding, director of 24-7 Prayer in the UK, is going to be leading our prayers today around an amazing resource called Lectio 365. It's a resource to help people in their daily devotion with God. It's made by 24-7 Prayer, involving lots of people from Emmaus. And so we want to pray that the spread of that would increase. So please uh, join with Carla right now as she prays for Lectio. Hi, I'm Carla Harding and I'm part of the 24-7 prayer team here in Great Britain. It is my great pleasure to help people learn to talk with God. And one of the ways that I and the team do that 
is through a resource called Lectio 365. If you're familiar with Lectio 365, you'll know we deliver it through a free mobile app and people can read or listen to something that helps them meditate on the Bible and then speak to God every single day. We want to help people encounter God in the morning and the evening, bookending their day with him. We would really appreciate your prayers for the Lectio 365 and for the sister resource Lectio for Families team. There are three specific ways we'd love you to pray today. The first is this. Currently, we are praying thinking and listening to God about what we should be praying through, what Bible passages, what themes God wants to speak through for the rest of 2022. Please pray that God would speak to us. Secondly, please pray for the amazing team that pour their creativity, their time into writing Lectio 365 and Lectio for Families. Pray for Holy Spirit anointing and creativity. And lastly, last month, about 170,000 people tried praying the Bible through these resources. It is our great privilege to serve them. Please pray for the people that open up the app, whether they are experienced prayers and mature Christians or people who maybe just found faith and are learning how to talk to God. Please pray that every single person who tries the Lectio resources meets with Jesus. Thank you so much. We hugely value your prayers. I'm going to pray now. Please add your amen. Father, we thank you that your word is living and active, that we can come to the Bible every single day and hear you speak. God, guide us as we go to the passages and plan out the rest of the year. Lead us to the places, the themes, the ways you want to speak to people. Father, fill us with your spirit. Those of us who are pouring our time into writing, help us, Lord. Help us make space for you. And finally, Father, for every person who tries learning to pray and tries to engage with you every day. Father, we just want to pray that you would bless them, bless them with your presence. Take them deeper in relationship with you and deeper in your word. Amen. Amazing. And finally, I just want to let you know about our back to school campaign. One of the things that we've been doing through our transformation activities at Emmaus for a number of years is an initiative called Back to School, where we want to provide pupils with everything that they need to be able to go to school. So backpacks, underwear, uniforms, school shoes. We're moving into the next stage of that. Last year, we had a big year with 225 referrals. But with the refugee crisis and the economic crisis, we have already seen 500 referrals come in for pupils who need additional help to be able to get the things they need for school. A pack costs £50 so we are needing to raise £25,000 to be able to provide for all of the pupils who have been referred. If you are able to give whether it's to buy one pack for £50 to buy numerous packs or even to just give £10 or £25 we would be incredibly grateful. A QR code is going to come up on the screen Thank you for your generosity. See you next week.